I'm Luke Walks. Thanks for watching. In today's video, we're going to be exploring the Ban Rak area in Bangkok, Thailand. In particular, looking at some important historical buildings that are related to the uh, colonial period. So the European, early European settlers, when Bangkok first became the capital, when the capital shifted from Ayutthaya down to Bangkok. So before I do that, I'm going to want to go and check out a Aussie cafe. Um, I just read about online. It's called the Hidden Milk Bar. And the Hidden Milk Bar serves all sorts of uh, Aussie treats. It was, it was started by, it was uh, created by a, 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 a Thai who was living in Melbourne. And so he's, uh, he, he created this cafe uh, which reflected his childhood when he was growing up in Melbourne. So I'm feeling a little bit homesick. I haven't been back to Australia for about two years. So I'm going to go to the milk bar and check that out. I've come to uh, Ban Rak area today because I read about this place online. It's called the Hidden Milk Bar. And when I read about it, it talked about having some Australian uh, milkshakes and treats. So I wanted to come and check it out. So here it is. So I'm here at the Hidden Milk Bar. Uh, I've just had myself a Pashiona. So growing up, I remember the Pashiona came in a can, but they make their own, uh, their own version, which was really delicious uh, and brought back a lot of memories. They also had lemon, lime and bitters. They had lamingtons. They had uh, iced vovo. Um, so if you're an Aussie and you want to have a little trip down memory lane, but not just, uh, yeah, trip down memory lane, or if you're homesick, come to the milk bar. Now, I'm feeling kind of nostalgic after, after having that little snack. Um, and I'm in the Ban Rak area, in the Chanom Krong area, and there's, I've noticed a lot of old buildings. So today, in my adventure, I'm gonna actually explore a lot of these old buildings, in particular, colonial Bangkok. So the period of time just after uh, when Ayutthaya, the fall of Ayutthaya, and the capital was shifted to Bangkok, and the Europeans that settled in this area, that's what I want to explore a bit more. I, I don't know too much about it, so I'm gonna explore that today. And I've just stumbled upon a noisy place. I've just stumbled upon the photo club and a place called Hidden Milk Bar. Now just on the other side of the road, when I, I'm coming from Australia, if I ever think about a milk bar, that was the kind of shop it would be. It was be like a small convenience store um, where you could buy your milkshakes, um, but also get and, and get some like, uh, just small groceries. It wasn't a grocery store, it was just your corner shop. Um, but also you, you, could, you could probably get your um, fish and chips there sometimes as well, uh, or play some pinball machines. But what eventually happened, these stores uh, went from a milk bar, started becoming more like a convenience store. And just as they were getting bigger and bigger, that's when the grocery stores arrived in, in Australia. So then the corner shops, the milk bars, died out pretty quickly uh, when that happened and the, the big grocery stores kind of took over. Uh, coincidentally now these milk bar shops, particularly in places like Melbourne and Sydney, are being converted into really cool cafes uh, or, or even pubs um, or restaurants. So it's nice this kind of uh, old building being converted and being still kept kind of intact. The architecture is still kept intact but it's housing a modern cafe. Um, so that's the milk bar. I'm now going to head to, I want to go up towards the Portuguese Embassy um, and also the Holy Church of the Rosary as well. So I think they've got some pretty, uh, pretty those two places are quite significant in the history of uh, the colonial period here in Bangkok. Chanong Kulung Road now and I'm going to head to the 
Holy Rosary Church. Holy Rosary was the uh, first church that was established here in Bangkok in the Ban Rak area. Apparently it's got some beautiful stained glass windows um, and it was, it was started by the Portuguese, so it's a Catholic church. So I'm gonna head there now. As I wander around Bangkok and discover Bangkok, one thing I always notice, how cool the uh, banks are if you ever get a chance. Just keep, it on, keep your eye peeled for some of the old banks. The architecture is so, so unique and so interesting. Here's, a big, here's an example over my shoulder here. by the movie Hangover there was a scene at the rooftop bar a very very uh, very distinctive uh, building that one there and I'll talk to you more about that building and a few other buildings in a future video so this video today is to explore the colonial period and areas and sites of Bangkok I've also got one kind of burning question that I'm hoping I'm gonna try try and learn today as I wander around is how was it that Thailand was never actually colonized because all the neighboring countries Cambodia Vietnam even to the south uh, Indonesia they were all colonized by the French the British and the Dutch however for some strange reason and hopefully I can discover this why was Thailand never colonized this Klong here that was built by King Rama IV and the reason it was built is to was to extend the area of his kingdom or with, with the or with a, which was the royal grounds uh, the Ratakonokosan area so there was an existing canal which uh, designated the where the uh, the royal palace area was uh, and this new canal was basically paralleled that existing canal uh, was pushed out about one one and a half kilometers outside so thus the area of the the royal grounds was enlarged now what that in, in had an effect on it was uh, the communities living in that area were then pushed out and is this area here and this ban rock area which uh the southern the southern side of the ratanakosan area was where the, a lot of the chinese vietnamese burmese and the European community started to, to gather and build communities. And so there's some in, important sites that were, were kind of had, had key significance into to growing these communities. And we're going to have a look at a few of those today. So one such area was the, uh, the Portuguese and the Holy Rosary Church. So we're going to go and have a look at that now. So this community has this canal, this Munruk area, and then the early colonial period and the flourishing of this community here in this Bun Rock area and Chinatown area as well, really has this canal to thank. I very much like the idea that it's a Sunday morning and church is in session at the Holy Rosary in Bangkok. Uh, I'm happy because it's a piece of history. This is the first church in Bangkok. It was founded in 1787. I, I really like the fact that it's still active uh, so many years later. So in 1787, uh, this church was built on land that was uh, gifted by King Rama I. So this was around the time when uh, the Ayutthaya had fallen and uh, the kingdom had relocated, shifted, uh, moved down to Bangkok. So it was around this time and, and we're just south of the Grand Palace and just across the stream is Icon, Icon Siam. So it's right on the river. It's a really, really good location. So the building behind me is actually the third incarnation of this building. The first one was made of wood and with a masonry base and it fell into, fell into disrepair. Uh, and that in the in 
in 1838, the uh, new church building was constructed. And then the third building, which is the one behind me now, uh, was completed and constructed in 1897. It's considered to have the most beautiful stained glass windows in all of Thailand. Uh, I'm not going to go in there just at the moment because the church is in session. The original name for this church was Kalawario, which was a transliteration of the word Calvary, and Calvary was where Jesus was crucified. Uh, and so the name has evolved over the years. Uh, to the locals also know this as Kalawa. And in fact, if you're walking around the streets here, you'll see signs that, that say Kalawa, uh, pointing you the direction of this way. As you can see the church, the building style of this church is a Gothic style construction. And just at the top of the archways there, you can see the Virgin Mary. Now inside this church, it's got some beautiful stained glass windows, considered to be the best the most magnificent, most ma most beautiful in all of Thailand. Now the location of the Holy Rosary Church is we're right on the Chow Praya River, which is just over here behind me. And also you can just see, just see, get a glimpse over there of Icon, Icon Siam. It's a very good location here. So the location here of Kalawa Church, the whole church of the Holy Rosary, is also a school. And uh, I like what they've done with the name Kalawa here. They've used it to create an acronym. Knowledge, unity, love, ability, responsibility, and then to put a B on the end, best person. So this is Kalab. Okay. Well, maybe there's more windows that I haven't noticed. Uh, now it makes sense. This school is actually called Kalawiteya School. Kalawiteya School. So the acronym over there makes sense now. So in 1787, this land here was gifted to the Portuguese community uh, to, to build this church here. And this was gifted by King Rama I. So this was around the time when uh, the capital had shifted after the fall of Ayutthaya, had shifted to, to, shifted to Bangkok. I do like uh, religious artifacts. I don't know how the uh, flamingo made it to this scene though. I don't remember that, learning that when I was in Sunday school. So the uh, Holy Rosary, the Holy Rosary refers to the uh, the crown, the, the crown of roses that uh, Mary, Virgin Mary has. And it's believed that uh, when anyone says, praise a Hail Mary, that we are gifting the Virgin Mary with another crown of roses. The rose is considered to be the queen of all flowers, therefore uh, the most revered and holy. So the original, uh, church here, cathedral, was the uh, owned, operated, for want of a better word, by the Portuguese. It was gifted to the Portuguese. However, uh, a few decades later, it was actually taken over by the French, the French missionaries. Now, the French uh, in 1822 actually also expanded and built another cathedral nearby, just south of here, which is called Assumption, Assumption Cathedral. And we're going to go and have a look at that now. So this was also because of the, uh, the growth of uh, Christianity in the area and also the uh, number of missionaries that were also in Thailand and around this period. Really like that logo. Now just outside the gates of the Holy Rosary, a really cool uh, little mini kind of roundabout and a really cool uh, sculpture. Made of spoons. Oh, I really like it. Spoon, spoons and machine parts. Now, uh, there's no 
uh, plaque here to explain this art piece, but I'm taking a guess what it means to me. Uh, the spoons represent all the food that's around available in the area and the machine parts at the base. There's also this area here in the Bun Ruck area. Uh, there's a lot of um, engine parts, machine parts are also for sale uh, and for repair shops as well for machines. And that's my interpretation. I do appreciate a sculpture. Uh, this sculpture here is in the middle of the smallest roundabout I've ever seen. This roundabout is called Talad Noi. Noi in Thai means small. At the Talad Noi uh, roundabout, there's a couple of hostels as well. I, re I, would, I reckon this would be a really cool place to stay if you're traveling to Bangkok. Um, now I also like the, the idea here, and you see this quite a lot around this Ban Rak area, which is some of the old buildings, uh, they've got these modern takes on the old buildings. So some of these hostels and also this uh, bar and restaurant here, you can see it's decked out with this modern kind of a, a restaurant and cafe set in this really cool old building. So I like how they're not, this area here, it's not smashing old buildings and putting new ones up, but it's actually using the existing architecture and kind of celebrating that existing architecture. Now, whenever you're walking around this area, you'll see lots of evidence of Chinese, the Chinese influence, um, which is being preserved as well. So it's a really cool area to wander around. You'll see, uh, see lots of interesting things. It's a great, great place to get lost at. So here we are, We're, this is, this is uh, at Talad Noi. This sign says it's this way to Chinatown. So. We're going to do uh, explore Chinatown in, much, in Chinatown in much more detail in a video in the future. But today's video, we're focusing on colonial, the colonial period of Bangkok. So, in future videos, I'm going to explore art as well. So, I'm going to explore Chinatown, but I'm also going to explore art and design in this Bun Rak area. into art and design this is really this is uh, the Talat Noi and Ban Rak area is the place for you sound so many cool uh, street art but also some of the old school style logos and signage around the place has really uh, captured my imagination Here's another cool example of some uh, design here. Asawin photo and video. So many of these, keep, keep, when you're wandering around this area, keep your eyes open. There's so many really cool signs uh, around the place. I've just been to the Holy Rosary Church. Now I'm stopping at House of Commons for a cup of coffee and a drink of water. outside House of Commons, which is a really cool little uh, cafe and bookstore. And the creek's here and there's two massive monitor lizards here.
So as mentioned before, it was the French who took over the operations at the Holy Rosary Church. And it was because of the, the Portuguese numbers decreased, but the French numbers increased, in particular with the missionaries. Um, so their, their influence and size grew so much that they actually opened up another cathedral, which is called Assumption. Now I'd like to get into there. So here's the Assumption College. So it's a, it's quite a big block of land. This whole, this whole area, the Assumption Cathedral has grown into this um, uh, school as well or college. So I'm going to go in and have a look at that if I can. So it was 1809 when this uh, Assumption Cathedral was consecrated, and I've just snuck in a one of the back, down the back entry. So a bit nervous. I might get kicked out soon. I don't know if I should be in here or not. So I'll just uh, tiptoe around. Okay, I think I found the building. Okay, I found the cathedral. I think I said before 1809, but it's actually 1909. And this cathedral was financed by a wealthy Chinese businessman in the area. And it is in the shape of a crucifix. So let me show you. World War I saw a lot of damage done to this uh, cathedral, so this has been rebuilt. And in fact, some of the rebuilding has just had re occurred just recently. In fact, in the 1990s, 1980s, these stained glass windows were installed as well. Assumption Cathedral was visited, has been visited by two popes. Uh, this statue is to commemorate the visit by Pope John Paul II in 1984. And in 2019, Pope Francis visited here and gave a uh, had a session with the youth, the Catholic youth in Bangkok. Here, it was to commemorate his, his it was his address had something to do with Youth Day, something like that. Unfortunately, the church is closed, so I can't go in inside and, and see it. So just can marvel at the architecture from the outside today. So I'm heading now to Captain Bush Lane. Uh, it's also the place of near Custom House, near the Portuguese Embassy, uh, House Number One, and also the warehouse of uh, Louis T. Leon Owens. So I'll tell you more about all of those things when I get there shortly. So that street's called Rue de Brust. And in the city in Brust in France, they've actually got a Rue de Siam as well. Thank you. 
fall of Ayutthaya, uh, Bangkok became the capital. And it was during this time that this block of land here, which is the Portuguese embassy, was, uh, was gifted to the Portuguese because there was a big Portuguese community in this area here, just south of the new capital the, where, where the Grand Palace is. Uh, so this area here was this first area that was uh, a, a block of land that was give, gifted to the Portuguese so they could uh, start their first uh, the diplomatic mission. The embassy was built first and then the, 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 the residence was built after that. Now, I've just been reading how it's an award-winning uh, building uh, and it's got some historical relevance and how amazing it is, but uh, I can't get in there to see it, sadly. In 1786, as a gesture of thanks to the Portuguese for their help in the uh, war against the Burmese, uh, the king promised uh, some, some land uh, to the Portuguese. The first piece of land was uh, donated and that is where the Ho Holy Rosary Church was built and we've toured that earlier. Uh, and then the second, they promised another piece of land uh, and that wasn't realized until a couple of decades later. But that land is just here and it's the site of the Portuguese embassy. So the piece of land actually was the former residence of Emperor Chia Long, who was here, uh, who was, one, uh, was a Vietnamese leader who was in exile. And this choice piece of land on the Chao Praia River uh, consisted of two shipyards and also uh, the emperor's, the emperor's, uh, the emperor's residence. Outside a fancy store at the moment. I think someone just told me to buzz off. <laughs> so the this uh, the embassy is uh, located on Charon Grung Road, uh, which but this little soy, this little section is known as Captain Bush, Captain Bush Lane. I'm going to talk to you about Captain Bush in a moment. Uh, but the embassy behind me, uh, the original building, uh, in the basement used to be a prison cell. And this was because of back in the day when uh, anyone, if a crime was committed, uh, then the embassy was the one who was to punish the nationals. So if any of the Portuguese got themselves in trouble, it was the embassy that had to deal with them and put them in prison. So in the basement of that place was a former prison. So I was just reading also that the doors on the embassy were actually the original doors from the uh, Portuguese embassy that was actually in Ayutthaya. So when Ay the fall of Ayutthaya, they took the doors of the embassy, shipped them downstream, and they're on the embassy today. It's sad I can't get in there to see it. Uh, this remarkable artwork here, this installation is called Scratching the Surface and I'm going to uh, explain it in greater detail in a future video and one of them, the videos that's coming up is called Ban Rak Art and Design. Uh, so, and then it's just down the road a little bit further is the River City which is also home of a lot of art galleries and this is actually coincidentally on the fence of the Portuguese Embassy and it's guarded by all of these interesting looking statues. Now this is on a famous road which is called Captain's Bush Road. So I'm gonna explain Captain Bush in just a moment. So right near the Portuguese Embassy is the fabulous Warehouse 30 and I'm gonna be exploring Warehouse 30 in greater detail when I do a future video which is dedicated to art and design in the Bunruk area. Let me tell you about Captain John Bush and his lane here. Now Captain Bush arrived in Thailand at a period of time uh, just after the Bo Ring Treaty was signed so therefore there was a lot of trade happening in the Chao Praia River uh, and particular at Customs House. So when he arrived this was really the, 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 the river was full of ships, trading ships, uh, and it needed to be managed. So that was Captain Bush's job. He was, he was assigned the task to manage the shipping in this area. When Captain Bush was here, uh, this area here where the Royal Orchid Sheraton is, and the pier, and the Portuguese embassy, 
was actually uh, a wat. It was called Wat Kiao Chem Fa. Now this this wat uh, was uh, was a bit of a problem because basically uh, the wat was uh, the refuse tip for the local locals. Uh, some absolute terrible stenches coming from this place. It was also it was also a pigsty as well, uh, and it contributed to the death of one of the uh, Europeans in the area who died of cholera. So Captain Bush and a couple of others wrote a letter to the king and said, "Can we do something about this temple? It stinks. It's disgusting." Uh, so the king agreed, um, but also at the same time, the abbot who was uh, at this temple was also not not so happy with the temple because uh, or the arrangement at the temple because first of all they were banned from doing uh, cremations here uh, but also it was dead smack uh, in the it was right in the middle of the European community and the Europeans were, were attending the church rather than the temple so the the relocation of the temple actually worked for both it worked for uh, the Europeans in the area and it worked for the abbot as well and that temple was relocated um, what is it called just let me check <clears throat> so I think I want to check I'm going to do another video in the future which is about the temples in this area and I'll visit it what is it called? Um, don't know So Captain John Bush actually did a magnificent job here at managing the uh, the riverways and the and the customs house area, uh, the customs area. Um, he did such a good job that the, the the king at the time actually put him in charge of some of the royal barges as well, and he was also involved in the navy, the royal navy here as well. Uh, at the same time, he had a few sideline projects, and coincidentally, he made a lot of money from these sideline projects. In fact. When he passed away, he was considered one of the wealthiest men in the land. And here, let's, it says here, uh, Captain Bush was a well-known and popular figure who eventually built a fortune for his large family. He had six children and two wives. And at his death, he was worth 1,240,000 baht. Now at the time, you could actually buy a house for 10,000 baht. So putting that in, into perspective, he was a very wealthy man. And it concludes here, in short, he became one of the most respected, wealthiest and popular men in Siam at his time. So much so that they've even named a street after him. at 19. I'll be exploring this in greater detail when I do the video episode about art and design in the Bunrak area. But it's a beautiful place, really beautiful. see it up there but there's actually a woodpecker I was walking along there and I hear a tap 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 it's a beautiful red kind of face oh there it goes I was talking too loud I've never seen a woodpecker in real life before I never thought I'd see one here in the middle of uh, the old uh, this old colonial area in Bangkok so it's a nice little treat 
dwarfed by the Sheraton is the warehouse of Lewis T. Leon Owens. Now the Leon Owens name is quite uh, well known in Thailand. Lewis's mother Anna was famous because she was the uh, King and I Anna. So she was the Anna that uh, was the English teacher to that was that was hired by the, the royal family, the King Rama IV, to teach King Rama IV's children English. So this building behind me is is Lewis Lewis T. Owens. Now Anna Anna's uh, Lewis's mother Anna and Lewis they arrived in Thailand uh, when Lewis was only five years old. So Lewis actually uh, grew up in the in the royal court and he learnt Thai and he got taught along with the other uh, children, the king's children. After, t after teaching uh, the, the king's children for some time, Lewis and, and the mother Anna uh, went on a holiday and when they were away on holidays, King Rama IV passed away and then uh, Anna was no longer, her services were no longer required. So mother, mother Anna, she moved to America uh, she was in New York City after she was after her teaching in in Thailand. That stint had ended, where, whilst Lewis went to to England, and that's where he continued his studies. Now Lewis was reunited with his mother uh, in America uh, some years later, and Lewis was there for a short time because he got into himself into a little bit of trouble and racked up quite a few debts and ran away, left the country, and where did he run away to? Back here to Thailand. Now. Uh, he was he arrived in Thailand it was kind of a right place right time scenario for Lewis because it was the time uh, when the Bowring Treaty was just signed which was a treaty basically allowing uh, Thailand or Siam as it was known as back then to do trade with other countries so here in the Chow Praya River which we're really close to uh, by the time Lewis arrived um, uh, returned sorry by the time Lewis returned uh, it was a really good time. It was really quite a prosperous time. And he was really well positioned because he was fluent in Thai. And he also had a lot of royal connections. So he became a very, very well, uh, well-to-do businessman here in Thailand. So this, this here, this, this is his, his warehouse. Main industries that Lewis was uh, uh, famous for and where he made a lot of money was with the wood and the hardwood, the teak wood. Uh, so he was well positioned here to be a timber trader. He also exported this hardwood to other countries. Uh, but he didn't just, that was, wasn't his only business enterprise. He also uh, did all sorts of manufacturing. So as a wealthy businessman, Lewis eventually left Thailand in 1913. And then in 1919, he sadly passed away in England. Uh, but he's very well known. He, while his mother's name uh, is not uh, not held in such high regard because of some of her claims and uh, some of the the uh, white lies she she shared in her memoirs. Uh, Lewis, on the other hand, was very well respected. Now, Lewis uh, Lewis T. Leon Owens was uh, his it was his company that actually supplied the wood for one of Bangkok's most well-known landmarks, which is the Giant Swing. Now, this is also so behind me is Lewis T. Leon Owens warehouse and then here on the same block of land is house number one. So I'm just going to share a little bit about house number one. From 1887 to 19 to the 1950s uh, there was a region which was known as the as French Indochina and that was the area uh, which was east of the Mekong River and it was the area which is now known as Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. So that was under that was a French colony. Wow, that's a beautiful bird over there. Just wait a moment. Sadly, I couldn't really capture it, but it had under it was a black bird. Underneath was this beautiful uh, emerald kind of blue color. Wow, this is quite fascinating. I've seen a woodpecker, and then that beautiful bird. Wow. So the Indochina region, so the, uh, the French, so the, domestically uh, the French oversaw all the different uh, productions, so the different uh, goods that were being produced including uh, alcohol uh, and they also exported from Indochina 
uh, to other areas. Um, now this, there's a company which was called, this, the management group was called Society, something like SFDI, Society France, French Francois, I've just looked it up, the SFDI, Society Francais de Distillery de Indochina. I'll keep calling it the SFDI. Uh, this was an organization which existed uh, to help manage all the exports and uh, the, the trade that was going on uh, from Indochina. Um, so it, when they opened their office in Bangkok, it's no coincidence that they opened it here because this was where the, this, this area here in that period of time had the largest European community as well. Uh, but it was also strategically located right near Customs House, which is what I'll do in a video uh, in the future, which is a magnificent old building on the Chow Phraya River. Uh, so it, it was strategically located near Customs House uh, here in Bangkok. Now, fortunately, uh, these, both these buildings have not been knocked down. Uh, house number one in particular, uh, it, it's, now it's got a coffee shop in there, um, but it's also been used for things like you can, people can rent it out for, for parties, weddings, things like that. Um, so it's really, really cool area around here. Now here's another example of uh, around this Banrak area where some of the old architecture uh, has been kept the, the building itself has been kept and then the inside the renovations have been modernized so it's this nice um, mash of old and new uh, and and done in a really classy way so this is a magnificent place even the gardens are really lovely here um, and it's just opposite the Royal Orchid Sheraton not far from Kalawa Holy Rosary Church and not too far from the customs house, not too far from the Portuguese embassy. Coincidentally, I'm used to bumping into uh, 7-Elevens as I travel around and walk, but I've been walking for quite a few hours and it's stinking hot and I haven't found one 7-Eleven. I wonder why that is, no idea. Burger at Sweet Pista. Uh, it's the cheeseburger with mushroom, and it was very good. I'm now I've now got a little bit of spring in my step. Time to continue continue on this adventure. Here's the French Embassy, um, and it's got such an interesting building, really modern, slick design, which you can't quite capture because of the big fence. But I am going to talk about this building and other interesting architectural pieces in this Banrak area in future videos. So there's going to be one about uh, interesting buildings, interesting architecture, in particular hotels as well, and rooftop bars. Oh yeah, we'll get a better view of it now. So this is the French, French Embassy. So there's only two embassies around this area. The, the Portuguese and the French both have their embassies here. Uh, most other embassies are found along Wireless Road. So just opposite the French Embassy is Harun Mosque. 
Now, Haroon Mosque, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about Haroon Mosque in our future video. And that video is gonna focus on temples and other religious places in the Manrak area. I've had a pretty big day out. I'm uh, pretty knackered, uh, but I've learned a lot. It's been a good day of discovery. Um, as the sun goes down, I just want to uh, reflect upon that original question that I had was, how was it that Thailand was never actually colonized? So I've just been doing a little bit of reading and I want to share with you uh, what I've discovered. There's a few factors involved. So I'll just find a little spot to sit down somewhere and I'll uh, share with you what I've found out. So just to provide some uh, context, uh, so this video we've been focusing on the uh, colonial period. So at that time, uh, to the east was Vietnam. Now Vietnam was controlled and ruled and colonized by the French. And then if you go to the west, there's Burma and Burma was colonized by the British. And then if you head south uh, to the Indonesian area, that was uh, colonized by the Dutch and that was called the Dutch Indies area. So right in the middle of all of this was Siam. It's the kingdom of Siam, and the king at the time was Chalalakorn. He's King Rama number five. And he was a very important figure and contributed a lot to why uh, Thailand was never actually colonized. So King Rama five, uh, at this time, he was the uh, king of Siam. Now, the, to understand this, the, the, the uh, geography of, and the culture of Siam at the time, there was a lot of different kind of areas or groups uh, and they had their own kind of rulers or leaders, but these leaders would pay tribute and for want of a, bottom, for want of a better word, uh, bow down to the more powerful leader. So the most powerful leader at the time was Ch uh, Chalalagorn. Uh, so all these different groups uh, would pay tribute and and in some ways, it was Chalalagon who unified this, these, all these groups. Um, so, it, and because of this unification, uh, Thailand started to become viewed as, as kind of like a, a, an organized society. And back at the time, um, when colonization was happening, it was kind of like the, uh, the, the European countries would go to these disorganized or savage kind of countries and would modernize them. But there wasn't quite that need to do this in Thailand. So this is kind of one of the contributing factors as to why Thailand was never colonized. It was kind of organized, it was getting organized. Um, and King Chalolagorn, he actually studied a fair bit uh, of European methods and, and ways. And he was instrumental in not only uh, unifying the people, but also modernizing society and even ch changing things like the, the, what the people wore. He made them look more modern, they were more organized. And there was kind of like, a, they also formed an army. And uh, there was also another uh, contributing factor that was when, when it was actually World War I, when World War I broke out, um, Siam was organized enough that they could actually send some troops. So this also put Siam on the world stage. So Siam was sending troops to the World War and it gained a lot of recognition with the other, other countries as well that it was really, it had something to contribute to the world and it didn't really need the colonization. Uh, it didn't need the Western ideology to try and organize it and try and bring them up to, to, to modernity. Uh, so this also contributed to the, to the factors of why, factor why um, Thailand was not colonized. Another key factor was an incident called the Pak Nam incident. Now back in, hang on, let me just check the date. 1893, the Pak Nam incident. Now this is when the French, there was an incident in, in the Chao Phraya River where the French, some um, uh, French naval vessels started to sail up the Chao Phraya River. And this put a lot of pressure 
on the relationship between the French and the CM at the time. Um, now, what happened, what was most, most significant about this was actually in the aftermath, because what, what happened is because there was some, some alterica altercation, uh, it was actually resolved quite peacefully. Um, and one of the conclusions was actually that there was a, uh, the borders for Indochina were actually changed. Um, so where Laos and Cambodia used to be part of Siam, uh, one of the negotiations uh, following or through this Paknam incident was that the Indo Indochina border changed to where the Mekong River is. So therefore, the Indochina area would actually include uh, Cambodia and Laos. So that was the French side. Um, so this actually, from the French perspective, this showed that uh, Siam was actually capable of negotiating. And they actually look, they're, 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 they're happy to find some peaceful resolutions and not actually go to war. So this was actually looked, what initially turned out, what initially looked out at to be a bit of a problem, turned out to be actually a, a, a good sign. And it held, uh, Thailand, it put Thailand into high regard, in particular, in particular King Chalalagorn, who, who was a very skilled negotiator. Um, now, another factor that also had a very big uh, uh, impact on why Thailand was never colonized is that Thailand geographically actually became, this uh, was actually like a nice buffer zone. So the French had their own issues uh, governing uh, all over uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos and, and um, neighboring country China as well. Uh, the British had their own issues with Burma. Um, and the, Indo, in the, and, the, and, the, and the Dutch also had their hands full with Indonesia. So they didn't really, they were actually comfortable not having to share a border with each other. Um, so this buff, buffer zone actually gave them a little bit more, uh, yeah, freedom to focus their efforts on other problems. So it was actually kind of a, quite a convenient um, uh, geograph geographical buffer zone uh, that instead of drawing up land borders and things like that and disputing land borders, it was like, it was just this neat little buffer zone to separate the French and the British at the time. So that's my brief summary of why Thailand was never colonized. Um, and um, I just want to make a disclaimer. I'm learning about Thailand, so I know probably in this video I've made a couple of little mistakes, but that's what happens when you're on that learning journey. Um, so if I've made any, uh, I've pronounced words wrong, or I've got some facts wrong. I'm very, very sorry. I'm trying my best. I've only lived in Thailand for a short time, um, so <coughs> what I'm sharing with you now is the is the information that I'm trying to make sense of um, while I'm wandering around and, and enjoying this city here. Um, anyway, I've seen enough today. It's time for me to hit the road. I uh, hope you've enjoyed watching the video. This is the first part in uh, several several videos, which is going to focus on the Bun Ruk area and the Sampan Pawong area. So if you've enjoyed this, there's more videos to come. Thanks for watching.